Okay, uh, welcome to lecture. We'll get started here in just a sec. We're going to continue on with the first chapter. It seems like a good place to start. Let's get everybody in. Also, a reminder, if you could, uh, in the chat box, just type here, and we'll use that for a roll. That'd be great. Okay, uh, so uh, we're starting talking about chapter one and a reminder that uh, sort of uh, in this um, book, we sort of kind of work a little bit different. We start with the atoms. Uh, so we're gonna talk about sort of the atom, electrons, protons, uh, neutrons. Uh, we talk about sort of the structure of the atom and we'll get into those electrons. And again, we kind of move on from there. Uh, so last time we started talking about just a little bit about chemistry. Uh, we talked about different states of matter uh, we have solid, as we talked about, where everybody's pretty much packed in there, pretty tight to one another. There's not a lot of room for movement. Uh, again, that's why solid things are typically rigid. They have a usually fixed sort of shape and kind of hard to uh, change the shape of it. We also have liquid where everybody's still sort of uh, packed in there, relatively tight to each other. Again, a little bit more room for movement, which is why liquids are fluid. Um, and then we have gas where obviously everybody has broken apart from each other. And as we talked about last time, we have our sort of changes of state uh, going from solid to liquid, which is melting, uh, going backwards from liquid to solid, which is freezing, uh, going from liquid to gas, which is evaporation or vaporization, and obviously uh, gas back to liquid, which is condensation. Uh, we also have the solid skipping the liquid phase altogether and ending up in gas, which is sublimation. And lastly, going kind of backwards there, gas also skipping the liquid phase and ending up over there in the solid, uh, which is our deposition. We talked a little bit about that in terms of energy. Um, again, as we go from solid to liquid to gas, you do have to put energy in to do that. And that is what is sometimes referred to as being endothermic, those processes where energy is being absorbed. And going the opposite way, as we go from gas to liquid to solid, uh, we do have to sort of give off energy. So as these atoms, molecules sort of lose energy, they no longer have enough really energy to keep away from each other. They start to sort of cling to each other. And you can imagine flying around sort of gas molecules uh, banging into each other and kind of clumping to the liquid and then into the solid as it continues to lose or release energy, uh, which is known as exothermic. And in terms of just the signs of those things, endothermic or exothermic, just in terms of energy, we will sometimes see along the way in a couple of spots, uh, if we have something that's exothermic, um, it typically is represented by a negative value for energy. Um, so exothermic is usually negative in terms of its value, while endothermic is typically positive in terms of its value. All right. So talking about matter and sort of some different um, representations of matters like atoms and molecules, Pretty much matter is all composed of tiny particles, which are atoms. And as we'll talk about, atoms contain even smaller type particles, uh, subatomic particles like our protons, our electrons, and our neutrons. And all matter is pretty much uh, made up of these atoms. Atoms are really sort of the simplest representation of an element. And it is as far back in terms of matter as you could go. So as far back as you could go is basically to break something back into its elements. They pretty much cannot go any further than that. As we'll talk about, essentially elements are kind of like the alphabet. Uh, you know, there's only 26 letters, for example, but different combinations of letters give us different words. Same idea here, sort of different combinations of elements uh, do give us some different compounds. Um, <clears throat> 
that are made that obviously have different properties, just like different words have different meanings, even though they may be composed of the same letters. So same idea. Now a molecule is two or more atoms that are joined together. And that's an important sort of thing that sometimes uh, people do have a little trouble with. Molecule and another word that we will sometimes that we should see a little bit later on in this chapter, but that other word is a compound. And a molecule is just a basic definition of two or more atoms that are basically joined together. A compound, as we will see a little bit later on, are atoms of two or more elements. And that is a, a major difference between sort of what something is a compound versus maybe something being a molecule. And what sort of helps us maybe distinguish that is that we see here, um, we have hydrogen gas, oxygen gas. There are certain elements which are molecules. So hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. These are all molecules. These are all what are referred to as diatomic molecules. Diatomic meaning that it has basically two atoms. So hydrogen gas is H2. Oxygen looks a little bit like this. Nitrogen looks like this. And again, these are all molecules because they really do meet the definition of a molecule. They are two atoms that are bound together. They are also actually all these guys elements. And that is how these elements come. They come as diatomic molecules. So if you ever have hydrogen by itself, uncombined, uh, not attached to anything else, it is always H2. Same thing with nitrogen by itself, uncombined always N2 and so forth. Now, when you look at all these, although they're elements and they are molecules, these guys are not compounds though. And that's something again, that sometimes confuses people, the compound molecule sort of difference. They are not a compound because hydrogen, for example, is two hydrogen atoms, oxygen is two oxygen atoms, nitrogen is two nitrogen atoms. Uh, so they're all the same element, which is why they are classified as elements, also classified as molecules, but again, would not be compounds. And we have our oxygen atoms and our hydrogen atoms coming together to make water. Water is H2O. Now water, is also a molecule because it has at least two atoms, but it is also a compound as well because it has atoms of two or more elements. It can make atoms of hydrogen and oxygen together. H2O is a compound, it is a molecule, it is not an element because it has obviously elements or atoms of two different elements involved. So that's something that sometimes comes about a lot in chemistry and causes sort of a lot of confusion with some people, that sort of difference between, you know, a molecule or a compound. And you, the easy way to sort of think about it is, again, a molecule is really just a simple definition of you just simply need two or more atoms for something to be a molecule. Those atoms could be the same element. Those atoms may be different elements, but you just need literally just two or more for them uh, to be a molecule. While if you want something to be a compound, as we will see, I kind of jumped ahead, I think, of several slides, but uh, something to be a compound, it does need to be at least two different elements involved. Uh, so when we do sort of write formulas and chemical formulas, we do use subscripts, and the subscripts uh, indicate how many atoms of that particular element is present. So H2O. The subscript always goes to the guy to the left. So this is right, two hydrogen atoms involved. Much like most things in chemistry, if nothing is written there, it is assumed to be one. So there would be one atom of, hydrogen, of oxygen in that particular case. Here O2 is two oxygen atoms and H2 would be two hydrogen atoms. So always when we sort of write chemical formulas, we use the symbols. We always use a subscript 
subscript is that number on the bottom always goes to the right of the atom or element that we are talking about. Now a chemical reaction uh, is when one substance is really changes into another and that's usually what sometimes referred to also as a chemical change where when we start with one thing it fundamentally changes to something else. So here we have water molecules. If you run an electrical current through water, it will actually break it apart. Again here, this is a compound that can be broken apart into its elements. At that point, you cannot go any further than that. That is as far back as you could go as the elements here. And we can make uh, water into uh, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas in this particular case. That is again a, a sort of chemical reaction, which is really a chemical change where we change something from one thing to the next. The important part of that is you typically cannot get back anything, uh, the original substance by any type of physical means. Uh, so what that means is you can boil it, you can melt it, you can freeze it, you will not get back the water. And unless you do some type of chemical reaction to do that. And this also shows and demonstrates that, again, this does not occur in what is sometimes referred to as a physical change. A physical change is when we start with something and end with something, and they both are fundamentally still the exact same thing. The only difference is something may look a little bit different. And that's an example like if we take an ice cube, and we take an ice cube and we melt it, it becomes liquid water. And if we take that water and put it up on the stove and start heating it, we will get it to boil and we will create steam. And steam, liquid water, and ice, they are all fundamentally the exact same thing. They're all fundamentally water. And that's why changes of state are referred to as really physical changes. Because we could technically take our liquid water and put it in the freezer and we would get our ice cube back. Uh, we could take all that steam that's happening when we boil water and we could cool it back down. It will go through condensation and we could get the liquid water back. So fundamentally, it is exactly the same thing. Obviously, when we create hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, that is very different and different properties than water. And that would result in a chemical change that has occurred. And again, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them. You could type them, you know, you could unmute yourself if you do want to ask a question. Uh, feel free as we go through, obviously, this lecture and all lectures, uh, feel free to ask those questions. So let's just talk a little bit about the scientific method a little bit. And science really, you know, the scientific method and sort of scientific discovery, if you will, usually all revolves around one major thing happening, and that is an observation. So typically speaking, we have some type of observation that occurs. And when an observation is made, we oftentimes try to sort of come up with an explanation or a sort of theory, if you will, a testable hypothesis uh, to figure out what is going on. And that's basically what a hypothesis is, is some type of explanation of an observation that we see and most importantly, when we talk about a, a hypothesis is that it is a testable sort of explanation of what's going on. Uh, so we want that testable explanation so that we can um, run experiments and experimentation. And that is usually what happens here. As we can see, we usually will go through, excuse me, uh, a process where we make observations uh, again, we sort of come up with this testable hypothesis, and that usually leads to experimentation. And experiments usually then will lead to, unfortunately, sometimes for people, more observations. And, you know, depending on who you're working for, they'll go, that's pretty interesting. And you would agree with them. And then they'll say, you know what, go do some more ex experiments. And it's can sometimes turn into this kind of loop where you kind of keep going back, going back around until eventually, you know, a couple of things may come about. Uh, you may have a theory, which is sort of a model or a explanation of what you've been observing. 
And the difference between sort of a theory and as we will see here in just a second, a law is in a theory, it can be, for example, later proven, maybe not correct, or maybe it's not correct in all aspects. It may be sort of revised as well. And that's really different than a law. At some point, a law is something that no matter what happens, this will always occur the exact same way. So there's sort of no revision. There's no like exceptions. It is always sort of going to always happen the exact same way. And, and that's sort of a law. While a theory, you know, for example, uh, Bohr's model of the atom or Bohr's theory of the hydrogen atom works really well for electrons, as we'll talk about, I think maybe in the next chapter, uh, works really well for electrons and hydrogen. It explains a lot of what we see in hydrogen, uh, but it kind of falls apart as we move away from hydrogen. So as we move away from hydrogen, things that have more electrons, it really doesn't hold up. And again, it does sometimes get modified along the way. And that's more of a theory than a law, like the conservation of mass or the conservation of energy. That always happens. We never really lose energy along the way. We never lose mass or create mass along the way. So those things are always sort of a constant in that sense that it will always happen that way, no matter what the situation is. Uh, kind of no exceptions, if you will. So again, a law really summarizes how things happen. A hypothesis, as I mentioned, is usually a testable type of explanation for what is being observed. And a theory is sort of an attempt to explain what is happening. Um, and again, overall explains a lot of what's happening, may later through more experimentation uh, be found not to be correct 100% of the time. And that's sort of the major difference between that and a law. So when we talk about sort of early chemistry, it all sort of started a long time ago where philosophers sort of explained matter as being made up of these really small, uh, indestructible type of matter, which they sometimes called atomos. And again, obviously that was sort of a a forerunner for atoms, obviously. Um, you know, a lot of work was done over a lot of years. And, uh, you know, there's been some revisions in terms of the structure of the atom, which we will definitely get into in just a sec. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of sort of laws that have came about. And some of these we will touch upon in some chapters. And some of these you may touch upon in later chapters or later classes like 200B if you go on and take that. Again, the law of conservation of mass, uh, which again, basically states that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. Again, uh, that's sort of a, always happens in that situation. And you know, we see that a lot, especially, you know, if you just think logically about sort of chemical reactions and just the process of what we do when we balance equations, right? When we balance equations, you need to have the same number of elements on both sides of the arrow, both your reactants and products. And that means if you started with five carbons on the left-hand side, you should end up with five carbons on the right-hand side. Again, they may just be in a different compound on the right-hand side, but you should end up with the exact same amount. And, uh, you know, that's why we do balance equations. Uh, another sort of law that as came about early on was was sometimes referred to as the law of definite proportions. So a given compound always contains the exact same proportion of elements by mass. So for example, you got H2O, which is water, always contains basically two hydrogens for every one oxygen. And by mass, that means every water that you come across basically has 16 grams of oxygen for every roughly two grams of hydrogen, which means they always come together mass-wise, uh, one gram of hydrogen for every eight grams of oxygen is you know, proportion-wise sort of how they always come together. And no matter where you sort of find your uh, water here, other places, 
you know, it always should have those two hydrogens to one oxygen, which should have that same sort of ratio uh, in terms of grams of hydrogen to grams of oxygen in that particular case. Another sort of law that came about was the law of multiple proportions. And that was uh, one that was, came up by uh, John Dalton. And he basically said that when two elements form a compound, the ratio of masses of the second element uh, that combines with one gram of the first will always be reduced to small whole numbers. So this is the idea where when we write chemical formulas or where atoms come together, they always come together in whole number ratios. So for example, we could have carbon monoxide, which is you know well, one to one. We could have carbon dioxide, which is a one to two. And we'll never have, for example, you know, 0.5 carbons for every, you know, um, you know, 0.5 oxygen atoms. So they'll never come together in sort of that non-whole number ratio. Yeah, and in terms of names, uh, you don't have to remember too much right now in terms of these names. We're going to get into next, uh, really uh, talking about a lot of the uh, sort of experiments that led to the understanding of the atom and those names you should know. Uh, and we'll kind of, you'll be able to kind of see them as we go through them in terms of those names. Uh, here you should probably just kind of know the idea of what these things are. Um, you don't necessarily have to know, you know, Dalton came up with this or, you know, Prost or any of those other guys. Uh, but coming into the stuff we're going to be talking about here in just a second, sort of the, uh, the structure of the atom and sort of how it came about, you'll need to know some of those guys' names and the experiments that they sort of uh, performed. So let us uh, sort of get into some of that, which is the idea of really um, how the atom came about, some of the important steps that led to sort of our current understanding of the atom. And a lot of it did start with uh, John Dalton and Dalton's atomic theory. And a little bit about Dalton. Um, oops, that was a little. Uh, he he was, uh, had a very good talent for math and science. Uh, he oddly would uh, you know, wake up every day and record the weather outside. And he never married, surprisingly. He did like to go bowling on Thursdays, which is, of course is an extremely important thing to know and probably will show up on an exam. So don't say Friday, Thursday would be the day. But basically, you know, sort of the important part about Dalton is he did come up with sort of a, a precise definition of what we sort of refer to as atoms. And again here, Dalton's atomic theory is not necessary correct in all aspects or later was sort of proven to be maybe not right in every aspect of it but there are very important parts that are correct and some that are not so correct as well and we'll kind of talk about those different ones here in just a second uh, so let's take a look at some of the the parts of Dalton's atomic theory and you do need to know uh, a he went bowling on Thursdays but you do need to know uh, some of the parts of his atomic theory Again, he thought each atom was made up of these tiny particles that are called atoms. Also, it was sort of thought to be indestructible. Uh, type of particles. And again, the indestructible part, not necessarily correct um, along the way. He said that atoms of a given element are identical and atoms of a different element are different in some way, uh, fundamental way. This also is not 100% correct either. Um, the existence, as we'll talk about in this chapter, of what are known as isotopes. Basically disprove that. And isotopes, as we will talk about, are basically the same element, uh, but they have different masses, which means they kind of have different numbers of neutrons. So again, atoms of every element are not 100% identical to each other. Uh, they are a little bit different, but again, he thought that they were, and obviously atoms of different elements are different from one another. He also said that chemical compounds are formed when basically atoms of different elements combine with each other. 
and a given compound always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms. And when these guys come together, they do try to come together in sort of the simplest whole number ratio when they, they do come together, but really a chemical reaction just involves the rearranging of these atoms into new compounds. And that is you know, true, that is basically what happens in a chemical reaction. Now, atoms themselves are not changed in a chemical reaction, and, and that is true. So that's sort of that conservation that we, that we talk about, that if we start with you know, four carbons, we will end with four carbons as well. And also some parts that aren't so right here, like I said, really the main two parts are sort of the, you know, they're indestructible type of things, atoms. Uh, there are nuclear chem chemical, let's see, let's try to say it again. There are nuclear reactions where we actually do change one element into another. And chemical reactions, normal chemical reactions, which is what we mainly study in this class, uh, that doesn't happen, but it does happen sort of in the nuclear reaction where we can change protons, neutrons, and those type of uh, uh, particles that are in an atom. And again, the idea that all atoms of the same element are identical to each other Again, that is not really correct either because of that existence of those isotopes. So those are sort of the four or five main points of Dalton's atomic theory. You do need to know them. You do need to know uh, the couple of parts where it is not necessarily correct. And let's talk a look at the next part, which I think will cover those two things just to illustrate it. So here we're looking at which, uh, which of the following statements regarding Dalton's atomic theory are still believed to be true? So these are ones that are still believed to be true. So let's take a look at each of these. So we got uh, elements are made up of tiny particles called atoms. So that is still true, right? Everything is made up basically the basic building blocks of elements are atoms. All atoms of a given element are identical, that is not true. Again, the existence of isotopes, which are the same elements but have different mass, means that they are not identical to each other. So that part of his theory is not correct. A given compound always has the same relative number and types of atoms, that is correct. Again, if you have H2O, it's gonna be two hydrogens for every one oxygen, no matter what the deal is. And atoms are indestructible. That also is not true either. Again, really nuclear reactions, uh, again, allow you to, for lack of a better description, basically get rid of an atom, an element, and make it into a new one. So those, those two in the boxes there are the parts of Dalton's atomic theory, which are still believed to be correct. And obviously the ones with the X's there are the ones that are believed not to be so correct anymore here uh, when we think about Dalton's atomic theory. All right, any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some other important guys and we definitely will hit these two guys a little bit later on as well when we get into the gas chapter. Uh, these are a couple of sort of uh, laws and theories that sort of came about. Um, and again, we'll see them again in that gas chapter. But uh, Guy Lussac's law, he measured basically um, under the same conditions of pressure and temperature, he found that the volumes of gases uh, that react with each other were basically proportional to the moles. Uh, so volumes and he dealt with really pressure and temperature relationships. And what he found was as the pressure went up, so did the temperature and as pressure went down, so does the temperature. Avogadro dealt with under the same pressure and temperature conditions that the volumes and the moles basically of gases were related to each other. So the volume was sort of proportional to the moles of the gases. And again, we will see more of this when we get into the gas chapter and talk about those guys. All right, so 
I think for now, we'll go, we're just skip that. We're not gonna worry too much about those right now. Here's sort of a representation of Dalton's atomic uh, theory. Again, he thought of it as basically atoms of different elements coming together. And as you can see here, these are all really atoms of two elements, nitrogen and oxygen. And really depending on sort of the combination that comes together, uh, we do get different compounds. And again, a compound is two different elements atoms of two or more different elements coming together. Again, different than just the basic definition of a molecule, which is two atoms coming together, two or more atoms coming together that could be the same element or different elements. So NO, which is uh, nitrogen monoxide, NO2, N2O, different combinations will give things that have different properties, uh, how they are bonded together. And again, they do come together here in sort of a whole number ratio, which is also something um, that was sort of thought of in terms of Dalton. So a couple of things sort of came out um, from sort of Dalton's experiments, if you will, or theory, I guess is a better way of wording that. And it was the idea that atoms are these basic units that could come in combination. So a lot of experiments that were done from 1850 to about the 20th century, really help demonstrate that although atoms are these super small guys, they still contain even smaller particles in there. And those are what are sometimes referred to as subatomic particles. And three subatomic particles are electrons, protons, and neutrons. And as you may know, electrons are negatively charged, has a negative one charge. Protons are positively charged and neutrons have no charge associated with them. And a lot of experiments were done to really sort of try to understand the nature of an atom, sort of its structure, how it's sort of put together. And a lot of advancements came about with sort of the development and the use of what is sometimes referred to as a CRT, our cathode ray tube. This cathode ray tube really helped us kind of understand what was going on in terms of electrons. So what we're going to talk about now is some experiments that helped us understand the nature of an electron and sort of who was involved. So as was sort of the earlier question here, we are going to talk about some uh, people with some names and you do need to know some of these names here and sort of what they did and what came out of these experiments. So a lot of early work on sort of electrons was done by a guy named Thompson. And Thompson basically used uh, the CRT tube, which is a cathode ray tube. And basically a cathode ray tube is a tube with usually sort of a electrical sort of field on it, like a negative side and a positive side. And basically what it is, is electrons, kind of like a beam of electrons. And one thing that's really important in chemistry, and as you probably know, is that idea of electrostatic attraction. Electrostatic attraction is a fancy way of saying opposites attract. So things that have the same type of charge repel each other, while things with opposite charge are attracted to each other. So just like in life, right, you get two positive people near each other, nobody wants to be there. You get two negative people near each other, also probably not a great deal. But you know, it's that only thing, they're like totally opposites of each other. You get a positive and negative person, right? They sort of balance each other out. And the same thing goes with charges really in, in chemistry as well, or in science. So if you have two things that are positively charged, they definitely don't wanna be near each other dropping that sorry about that uh, you have two things that are negatively charged um, they also don't like to be near each other they sort of repel each other but things that are positively charged and negative charged have a very strong sort of attraction to each other and when we have this sort of tube this beam of negatively charged electrons would definitely move away from the negative plate in this tube and would head towards the positive plate 
uh, in this tube as it would be attracted to it. And sometimes they would put something on the end of it where it would sort of light up and fluoresce as those beams of electrons hit it. So Thompson did a lot of work with CRT tubes and he did a number of experiments. And the important thing that came out of Thompson's experiments is this right here, and you need to know this. It is the charge to mass of an electron. So through his experiments using the CRT tube, he was able to really determine the charge to mass of an electron. And here is a prettier picture of a CRT tube. Um, again, this sort of beam of negatively charged particles heading towards the positive side, away from the negative side, and again, usually a fluorescent material. You may be familiar with CRT tubes. If you have perhaps a, a older TV or perhaps an older computer monitor, I've seen one of those, those ones that have kind of like the big back in them, um, not obviously flat screens or anything like that. Um, those are usually CRT tubes, you know, picture tubes, they kind of used to call them for TVs. And that's sort of what, um, you know, a CRT tube uh, sort of looks like. New TVs are pretty much computers, right? And transistors and, and capacitors and those type of things. So not so much uh, th these type of tubes in them, um, but that is very common. So he did a lot of experiments with those. As I mentioned, there he is staring at his tube. And this is the major sort of result that came out of Thompson's experiment. He found that the electron had a charge to mass ratio of minus 1.76 times 10 to the 8. C is a coulomb. It's a unit of electrical charge uh, divided by grams. So coulomb, which is charge, grams, which is mass. So charge to mass of an electron was determined by Thompson. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know the exact number of it, uh, but you do need to uh, know that he was able to determine the charge to mass of an electron. And this was really a really good sort of first step, if you will, in terms of understanding electrons and sort of the nature of atoms as well. So another really important step along the way uh, in, in sort of experiments was one that was done by Robert Milligan. And Robert Milligan performed what is referred to as the oil drop experiment. And in the oil drop experiment, pretty much like it sounds like, he had sort of a chamber. And in that chamber, he had like an electrical field kind of set up. He shot in some oil droplets. They were kind of heated up and atomized and he would have this little hole where it would go through. And by natural sort of effect in gravity, the oil droplet would start to fall and also pick up sort of a charge as it's doing so. But he was able to, in his experiment mill again, adjust the electrical field in such a way that he was basically able to take that oil droplet that was kind of falling and basically allow it to just kind of be suspended there. It wouldn't go up, wouldn't go down. He was able to really dial in that electrical field to sort of match the charge that that oil droplet was basically gaining. And the important sort of outcome of that is, as I just mentioned, he was able to determine the actual charge of an electron. And here's a much prettier picture of that setup here. Again, you have this sort of electrical field in this chamber. Oil droplets go in and get atomized, a little bit of a hole. And again, he was able to sort of adjust that um, electrical field to allow that oil droplet basically just to hang out there. And he was able to find the charge of an electron. And he found that the charge of an electron was minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that was really important if we think about these two major experiments that helped us understand the electron a little bit better. We got Thompson that figured out the charge to mass of an electron. We have <clears throat> Milligan that was able to figure out the charge of an electron. So if you kind of put both of those experiments together, 
you take Milligan's charge of the electron and you divide that by the charge to mass of an electron that was found by Thompson, that will allow you actually to figure out the mass of an electron through a calculation. So these two experiments are really tied together in that sense. They were able to be used to really figure out the actual mass of an electron. And when you do that calculation, we do get the mass of an electron and the mass of an electron is something like 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 28. And <clears throat> you should know that that is a pretty small number, right? That's like 28 places that way with a bunch of zeros. Uh, but this is the mass of an electron, 9.09 .09 .09 times 10 to the minus 28. So just to sort of summarize up until this point, two major sort of experiments that you do need to know about. One was done by Thompson. You need to know that Thompson worked with CRT tubes. And as a result of working with the CRT tubes, a little bit about what a CRT tube is, uh, he was able to figure out the charge, the mass of an electron, followed by another important experiment, which was done by Milligan, where he did the oil drop experiment again able to adjust the electrical field to allow that drop to hang there able to figure out the charge of an electron and again putting both of those experiments together able to determine the mass of an electron so if we think about our atom and sort of the belief of the atom we have our protons our neutrons and our electrons so so far we have now had a couple of experiments that helped us have a better understanding of electrons any questions on that so far? So now again, there was this really belief that, you know, we know that these atoms do contain these negatively charged electrons. It was very much believed by the early 1900s, a couple of really important things. And one was that Obviously, from these experiments, atoms do contain these negatively charged electrons. It was also believed that the atom was neutral as a whole, which means because we already know they contain negatively charged electrons, and in order for them to be neutral, they do have to contain something that is positively charged. So there were some theories and some ideas about the atom early on, and one was proposed by Thompson of sort of a early model of the atom. And really the early model of the atom proposed by Thompson was that we have this atom and sort of spread out over the atom, really diffused over the entire sphere is we had all this positive charge. So all this kind of positive charge spread out all over here. And it was believed and sort of put forth by Thompson that in addition to this positive charge that's really spread out, we have all these negatively charged electrons embedded inside uh, the atom. So negatively charged electrons. And most of the mass of the atom was made up of the electrons. And this is what he commonly referred to as the plum pudding model was basically the idea he looked at his desserts and said, yeah, that kind of looks like what the atom is. The raisins are like the electrons, the pudding is like the positive charge that sort of spread out. And this was sort of the early model of the atom, sort of an early accepted model of the atom was this one that was sort of proposed by Thompson, this plum pudding model, where we do have this sort of sphere of positive charge all spread out and these electrons embedded inside um, of the atom uh, with this negative charge. And again, the idea here is that would account for atoms being neutral. We got all this positive charge out there to balance out our negatively charged electrons. And again, that most of the mass of the atom was basically made up of those uh, electrons. And it's just sort of an accepted model of the atom and people continue to sort of try to understand the model of the atom based on this sort of theory. And the next really major experiment that came about that you do need to know about is one that was done by Rutherford. Uh, 
And that is the one that's known as the gold foil experiment. And Rutherford basically did the gold foil experiment where he and a couple other guys, uh, Geiger, like the Geiger counter and Marston, they used alpha particles to basically probe the atom. So alpha particles are radioactive particles. There are usually alpha particles. There are beta particles, which are radioactive. And there are gamma, which has no charge. So when we talk about alpha particles, they are positively charged, heavy radioactive particles. They are essentially the helium nucleus. So sometimes you'll see helium used as a symbol. Beta particles are really negatively charged radioactive particles. They are almost equivalent to electrons. And gamma guys are radioactive uh, energy that has really no charge. Yeah. And we could use radioactive particles to help us out and the idea of you know, electrical fields and that type of stuff to help us. So for example, if I had an electrical field where we have a positive and a negative, and I shoot a stream of particles and it bends towards the positive guy, what I would know in that case is that this stream of particles, because it went towards the positive guy, away from the negative guy, I can make a pretty good guess that that beam of particles is most likely negatively charged. Again, the idea here is opposites attract. If I shot a beam of particles and it bended towards the negative side, that would tell me that probably those beam of particles are positively charged. Again, opposites attract. And if I shot a beam of particles and it just went straight on through, no problem, probably tells me I have something that has no charge. So sort of taking advantage of these radioactive particles um, and sort of the known charges of these radioactive particles helped out in sort of the exploration of atoms. The nice thing about, I guess, radioactivity, if you do it safely, is you can follow radioactivity so you can really see where it ends up and so forth because it's radioactive, so you're able to really follow those guys. So what Geiger, uh, not Geiger, uh, Geiger and uh, Rutherford really, Rutherford really did here is he took pieces of gold foil and other metals and he basically shot it at um, alpha particles at these pieces of gold metal and other uh, atoms as well. And based on sort of the early model here of the atom, they really did expect something to occur. And as we will talk about here in just a second, they were a little bit surprised on what actually did occur. But based on sort of the Thompson model here of the atom, which is our plum pudding model, they expected that when they shot these alpha particles at this atom, they expect it to go through with some deflection. Again, remember that all that blue is positive charge. Here we're gonna shoot alpha particles, which are positively charged, radioactive sort of particles. And we would expect it to sort of go through. So for example, you know, if you took like a, uh, dun -dun. Take just a piece of paper, maybe we got something here or not. So if you just take a big piece of paper and it was spread out and two people held both sides of the paper and you sh like threw or shot a pen at the paper, it probably would bounce through, right? But as it would go through, if both people held both sides really tight, it would go through and you'd probably see some reflection or deflection as it made its way through that. Again, we're shooting these positively charged particles at something that has a positive charge really spread out. So we would expect it to bounce in and then bounce out as it went through. And that's sort of what they expected to happen when they shot these things at it. Um, but what they actually saw when they did the experiment was something that was really surprising to them. And this is sort of the setup here of the experiment. They have a source of those alpha particles on the left. They have this sort of uh, little detection ring. Here's our atom in the middle. And what they saw was that when they did this experiment, most of the particles 
just sailed right through, no problem. So it just went straight on through, hit the back of the detector, almost like a straight line. But every so often, what would happen is they would start to see these alpha particles being sprayed out or being bounced off at these large sort of angles, like we see over here. And even some of them headed back in that direction as well from the place where uh, they were shot at. And if you think about what we've been talking about, in order for something to be bounced off at those large angles, it did have to hit something. Just like when they saw that most of those particles went through undeflected and had no problem, and some of them every so often would be bounced back. So like shooting a gun at a piece of paper and having the bullet come back at you, probably not so good. And what that means is a couple of things if you think about it. If most of them just sailed right on through, no problem, you would have to think that it hit pretty much nothing. Right? So it hit nothing, no problem, or anything like that. But now if you think about like that example I had where you had a piece of paper where the entire paper was all the positive charge. And you take that same piece of paper and you fold it and then fold it and then fold it. Where they say you could only fold a piece of paper seven times, six, seven times before you can't really fold it anymore. And if you take all that positive charge, which was normally out here and really spread out, and you just bring all that positive charge into this really small little folded pieces of paper, and then you try to throw your pin at it. Well, what happened, you could try to set home, fold a piece of paper until it's really, really small, square and throw your pen at it. And what you'll see is, as usually what happens when we're in person, the pen bounces off, right? So it'll hit and basically bounce off at these large angles. And that is because instead of our positive charge being really spread out and kind of diffused over a big area, when these alpha particles come in, they had to hit something that was super positive in order to make those alpha particles bounce off at those really large angles. And that was obviously something that they did not expect to happen based off of the plum pudding model where they envisioned on the left, this is sort of what they envisioned was going to happen. Again, those guys would go through, there would be a little bit of deflection. You got these heavy alpha particles moving really fast. It is going to be able to make their way through. But again, what they saw was most of them just kind of sail through no problem. But again, here we have those guys that bounced off at those really large angles. And what that meant was it definitely had to hit something that was super positive in the middle. And ultimately what that meant was in terms of the plum pudding model, Rutherford after the experiment pretty much had to put a big X over it, if you will, and go, I don't think this is the correct model for the atom. And they sort of had to come up with sort of a new model of the atom based on their results. And basically he explained sort of his findings as we see here that he explained that most of the atom was empty space. And because it was mostly empty space, that accounted for why we saw most of those alpha particles have no problem. They just headed straight on through, no problem. He also said that the atom had a very dense positive core, which is called a nucleus. And as we'll talk about, the nucleus is where we find our protons, which are positively charged. And he found that electrons were out from the nucleus at some distance traveling around. And as you may know, or maybe you don't know, and we will talk more about it in probably next chapter, I think, electrons do not travel in pretty circles. They do travel pretty randomly about the nucleus. And later on, we'll also find that neutrons are found in the nucleus of the atom. Now, there is going to be some attraction, right, between the electrons, which are negatively charged, and the nucleus, which has those protons in it that are positively charged. Again, that opposites attract. And as we'll talk about in later chapters, that is what accounts for why some electrons are involved in bonding, other electrons are not involved in bonding, and that's ultimately you know, what accounts for all that is uh, 
you know, that sort of electrostatic attraction. As we'll talk about clearly, when electrons are really close to the nucleus, they're going to be held a lot tighter than if we have electrons sort of further away. So this is sort of the modern version of the atom that we go with today as well. And you do need to know the different parts of it. Again, the atom is mostly empty space. It has a dense positive core, which later was found to have the protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which has no charge. And electrons are flying around the nucleus at some distance. Um, and again, not in a pretty pattern. And the other thing that it was found that was different in the plum pudding model was most of the mass of the atom was the nucleus, as it says here. So most of the mass of the atom was the nucleus. Um, and again, as we'll see why that is in just a second here. So to sort of summarize this little part of it here, you do need to know Rutherford. You do need to know he did a gold foil experiment. You need to know what the experiment was. You need to know what alpha particles are. And you need to know what he thought was gonna happen. And you need to know what he actually saw happen when he did the experiment. And obviously you need to know what the plum pudding model was and the new modern version of the atom, uh, which is the currently accepted version of the atom uh, that came out of Rutherford's experiment. Any questions on that there? This table here just sort of summarizes a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. Uh, Thompson and his uh, cathode ray tube that charged the mass, Milligan and his oil drop experiment, and uh, Rutherford and his gold foil experiment. So really, um, these are uh, the three major sort of experiments that really helped us get a, a pretty good understanding of what is going on in terms of the atom and sort of where all these subatomic particles are and some of the properties of these subatomic particles uh, when we go through it. So now that we sort of understand that the positive charge in an atom is basically in the nucleus, there was obviously experiments that were done to identify these particles in the nucleus, and they were obviously called protons. And protons are positively charged, and they have a mass of 1.67252 times 10 to the minus 24. And if you remember, our electron was 9.09 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. A proton, as you can see here, is about 1,840 times heavier than an electron. And that also helps us understand Rutherford's model, because remember that the early model said that most of the mass of the atom was the electron. And Rutherford sort of disproved that and said that most of the mass of the atom is the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is where we have our protons. And each proton is about 1,800 or so times there, heavier than any electron. So that does make sense based on what Rutherford sort of said, that the mass of the atom is made up there of the nucleus. So sort of at this stage in our sort of process to understanding the atom, a couple of things were sort of uh, thought of. The atom, you know, is super small. So although, again, it is really small, it does have these subatomic particles in them. And you could think of the atom as, for example, the size of the superdome, and the nucleus is kind of like the marble on the 50-yard line. If you've ever been to the Superdome, it's big and you feel like you're going to fall out of the seats. Um, but uh, any big stadium, if you will, the new Ram Stadium, I guess, they just opened. Um, again, a big stadium like that. And again, the nucleus is sort of on the 50-yard line. Again, the idea there is the atom is really like a big stadium, mostly empty space. And again, those protons and later found to be neutrons in that nucleus found, you know, sort of in the center. Electrons, again, are sort of confined to that space outside of the nucleus and sort of are flying around. As we talked about, and as we'll talk about in later chapters, again, 
Um, not really sure exactly how they're moving. They don't move in these pretty circles. You really don't know at any given point in time exactly where an electron is or how it's moving. And as we'll talk about, that's what's sometimes referred to as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, you really don't know at any given point exactly where a particle like an electron is or how it got there. And as we'll talk about in a later chapter, the best that you could really do in terms of electrons is go, I think there's a pretty high probability of finding an electron in this area of the atom, um, but still have no idea how it got there, how it's moving. And we would expect, as we've been talking about, that there's a pretty high probability near the nucleus of finding that uh, electron being present, again, because of that opposites attract. Now, the last sort of particle, which is the neutron, it was always thought that in addition to in addition to our protons that are there, in addition to our electrons, and especially in the nucleus, it was really thought that there had to be one more particle sort of there. And that particle was later found to be called neutrons. It was actually found in 1932, so not terribly long ago. Um, and it was found that neutrons have a mass of 1.67495 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Now, if you're keeping track of all that, there is a reason why they take it out to so many digits, because if you remember, our proton was 1.67252 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. And you can see by going all the way out there in that digit right there, our neutron actually is heavier than our proton. So just slightly heavier. And they're both way heavier than our electron, which is here. So this also helps us understand that Rutherford is probably correct in the idea that most of the mass of the atom is made up of the nucleus because inside the nucleus, we have protons and we have neutrons. And both of them individually, they're both about 1,800 or so times heavier than any electron that is flying around. So that does pretty much help us understand that the most of the mass of that atom is found in that nucleus. So you do need to know, obviously, the model of the atom. You need to know where protons are, where electrons are, where neutrons are in the atom. You need to know their charges. Uh, positive, negative, and no charge. And you do need to know which one is the heaviest, which one is the lightest, and which one's in the middle. You do not need to know the exact numbers that you see on your screen, uh, but you do need to know if you were asked a question like, out of those three subatomic particles, protons, electrons, neutrons, uh, which one would be the heaviest? So you need to be able to sort of identify it in that sense. Like I said, um, you don't necessarily have to give me the numbers. And in fact, the numbers might even be provided for you probably. Um, but you do need to be able to sort of pick them out that way. Any questions on that there? Okay. Uh, so here's just a slide that sort of reiterates what we've been talking about again. Electrons found outside the nucleus, negatively charged, flying around in sort of a random pattern, not pretty circles or anything like that around the nucleus. Protons found inside the nucleus have a positive one charge and is the second heaviest out of all of the particles. And our neutrons are also found in the nucleus, have no charge, and is the heaviest of all three particles, just barely beating out the proton. And again, protons and neutrons about 1,800 times heavier than any electron that is flying around. The nucleus, as we talked about, is small compared to the overall size of the atom. Again, uh, sort of a prettier picture of it here. This is sort of our idea of what the atom looks like. This really pink area here is what is sometimes referred to as the electron cloud. <clears throat> 
That is where we expect to find electrons. Again, moving around pretty randomly, not in pretty circles. Again, our nucleus, as you can see here, is super small. And again, some attraction between the negatively charged electrons and ultimately the positively charged nucleus because of those protons. This kind of redness, as we were talking about, is as we'll talk about in the next chapter as well. This is our electron cloud and kind of the darker red is a higher probability of finding electrons as it gets lighter in color, a lower probability. And perhaps you can make it on your screen or not, but kind of near the nucleus here is much darker. And as you kind of head out this way, the pink gets lighter and lighter. And again, you're getting further away from the nucleus, which means it's not gonna feel as much of a positive attraction, uh, those electrons. So they're not gonna be held as tightly and they're probably not gonna be found as in those areas, perhaps as much as you would near the nucleus. All right, any questions on the atoms, some of the important experiments? So again, just to reiterate some of the important experiments and stuff that you need to know that we've been talking about. Again, Dalton's atomic theory, the parts of Dalton's atomic theory went bowling on Thursday, not part of it, but good to know. Um, what parts are correct, which parts are incorrect. Again, Thompson and his CRT tube, exploring electrons charged to mass. Milligan oil drop experiment, charge of an electron, putting those together gives us the mass of an electron, followed up by an early model of the atom by Thompson, which is the plum pudding model. You need to know what it is and what it was about. Followed up by a next important experiment, which was Rutherford's gold foil experiment, where he shot alpha particles at pieces of gold foil. And again, you need to know, as we talked about, what he thought was gonna happen, the movement away from the plum putty model to the modern version of the atom. And obviously you need to know the modern version of the atom, what it looks like, empty space, nucleus, protons, neutrons, electrons moving about. And again, the charges of those particles and the, um, which one is the heaviest and lightest. Any questions on any of that stuff? Okay, so then we're gonna get into some uh, ideas about protons, electrons, and neutrons, how to count all that stuff up uh, as we go through. So a lot of chemistry and most of the chemistry of the atom does come from electrons. So if you think about what's going on, since electrons are on the outside of the atom, when two atoms come together, they really are the first ones to say hello to each other. They come in contact with each other. They are the basis of bonding and some of the different properties that we get when atoms do come together. So we're gonna talk about atomic number, mass number, and isotopes. We'll start a little bit about isotopes. So come back here. Isotopes, as I mentioned earlier, are really the, the same element, uh, but they have a different mass, which means they have the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. And they do show very similar uh, chemical properties. And that again is because main thing that happens in a chemical reaction or any type of normal reaction is pretty much electrons being involved. You don't really involve protons. You don't really involve neutrons. You don't involve those guys that are in the nucleus. The only place that you do is when you do nuclear reactions which again, you'll get into in 200B if you take 200B. But the nice thing about isotopes is they are, uh, they do the exact same chemistry. So a lot of isotopes are radioactive versions of elements. And the nice thing about that is you can kind of use that radioactivity uh, to do experiments and follow what's happening with a particular element because it's radioactive. So you could just kind of follow the radioactivity for example, if you took copper and you use a radioactive version of copper, copper 67, copper 64, or something like that, uh, in the body and so forth, the copper will behave the same way, even if it's radioactive or sort of non-radioactive. Uh, but the benefit of that is you could kind of follow what's going on 
um, by following the radioactivity, you can see exactly where copper, for example, ends up in a particular reaction. So here are two isotopes of uh, sodium. The one on the left has 11 protons and 12 neutrons. And the one on the right has 11 protons and 13 neutrons. So you might even be able to determine that from this picture, but they are both sodium and the number that they share in common is the protons. So the protons are important because it basically will tell you what element you are dealing with. So in terms of protons, electrons, and neutrons, the one that really is the most important is the number of protons. And there is a number that corresponds to the number of protons, and that is what is referred to as the atomic number. So the atomic number, which is Z, is the number of protons there are in an atom. Now, if an atom is neutral, and because there really are only three particles in an atom, protons, electrons, and neutrons, if we know the atomic number, which is the number of protons, which is the positive guys in an atom, it will also tell us the number of electrons. Because if something is neutral, that means all the positives and all the negatives has to cancel each other out. And if we know that it's neutral, we know the atomic number, we will also know the electron. A very important point on that is, if you are asked what is the definition of an atomic number, the actual definition of an atomic number is only the number of protons. So if you're asked a straight up question of what is the definition of atomic number, the correct answer is just the number of protons. Second to that is if it is neutral, it will tell you the number of electrons, but the actual definition is just protons. So again, sometimes people get that confused. And when you look at the periodic table, if you got one hanging around somewhere, it's the part where I point to the wall that usually has a periodic table in the classroom. You will see some boxes that you know look like so, and you will typically see a number that's up on top of the symbol. And these numbers that you see on the periodic table above the symbols are the atomic numbers. And if you do look at a periodic table, if you happen to have one near you in your book or wherever it may be, you will also notice that if you look at all the numbers that are on top of every symbol that's on the periodic table, you will not find one that actually is the same. So every single element has its own atomic number, which means the number of protons. And as I just mentioned, the number of protons is the most important. It tells you what element you are dealing with. So for example, if you look at the periodic table and you look at number 10, perhaps. Yeah, should say neon, I hope, unless they changed it, but we'll go with neon. And that means that if you have neon or a neutral neon atom, it should have 10 protons, which is its atomic number. It would also mean that it should have 10 electrons because all the positives and negatives should cancel each other out. You will never find a neon atom with seven protons. And that is because the person that has seven protons is actually nitrogen. So again, if you look at those numbers, you will not see any that repeat. So the atomic number can be found on the periodic table. And again, if you know the atomic number or the number of protons, which is really the same thing, you will know exactly what element you are talking about. Another important number when we talk about protons, electrons, and neutrons is the mass number. And the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons that you find in an atom. And why that's important with our atomic number is that the mass number, 
is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. The atomic number is the number of protons, which means if you subtract those two, protons cancel, and you can figure out the number of neutrons. So if you take the mass number minus the atomic number, that will give you the number of neutrons that are present. Pretty much every single element will have protons, electrons, and neutrons. Our only exception is our good friend hydrogen, which is a lot of exceptions. But hydrogen actually only has a proton and an electron. It does not have a neutron. So everybody else will have protons, electrons, and neutrons. Hydrogen is sort of an exception to that. It only has a proton and a electron, no neutrons. Now, when you're asked to calculate the atomic number, the mass number, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, all of those guys have to be whole numbers. So that brings up a really good question of, since I'm looking at the periodic table, And my boxes look something like this. We already established that our top number is the atomic number. So it would make sense, right, that the bottom number here would be our mass number. And the answer would be no, it would not be your mass number. As it says right here, mass number, atomic number, protons, electrons, and neutrons, they all have to be positive whole numbers. And if you look at the bottom number on the periodic table underneath every element, for the most part, nobody there is a whole number. These are not the mass number. This is what is known as the atomic mass, which oftentimes confuses people. And the reason that is, is because a lot of times when you do calculate the mass number, it is a number that is very close to the number you see on the periodic table. But technically speaking, that number that is below the symbol is not the mass number, it is the atomic mass. So what that means is the only number that you can find on the periodic table is the atomic number. So the atomic number is the only number that you can find on that periodic table. Any questions on that? So that's a very common mistake that people make. They're asked to give the mass number and they just write that number on the bottom of the periodic table and it will be wrong um, again because that is not the mass number. Now isotopes as we talked about are again that same element but has a different mass. And for example here, hydrogen, can be uh, hydrogen, which has one proton and <clears throat> no neutrons. It could be deuterium, which is sometimes referred to as heavy hydrogen, one proton and one neutron. Could be tritium, which is sometimes referred to as radioactive hydrogen. And one way that we commonly write symbols for isotopes is we use the element symbol, and on the top left, we put the mass number, and on the top, um, bottom right, uh, I'll get my right and left there. On the bottom left, uh, we put the atomic number, top left, the mass number. So we could write the symbols for each of these guys. And if we look at hydrogen, it has one proton. That is the atomic number, which means if you weren't sure what the symbol would be, you'd go to the periodic table, find number one, and it would tell you it is hydrogen. Atomic number, which is number of protons, is one. One plus zero gives me one for our mass number. And up on top would be one. So that would be the symbol for hydrogen. Deuterium, even though it doesn't say hydrogen, you would know it's hydrogen because again, it has one proton, which means the atomic number is one. And you would go to the periodic table and see number one is still hydrogen and number one's atomic number is still one. But deuterium has one proton plus one neutron, gives you 
two for the mass number, which would go up on top. And lastly, tritium again, doesn't really scream hydrogen, but what does scream hydrogen is it has one proton. So again, hydrogen would be the symbol, air H. One would be our atomic number. And here we have one plus two, which would give us three for our uh, mass number, which is on top. Again, each of these things are hydrogen because they all contain one proton, which means they are isotopes of each other. And ultimately, they are the same element. They all have different masses because, again, they have different numbers of neutrons. And again, so the take-home message here is that the proton is really important in terms of identifying what element it is. And the second take-home message is don't use the number for the mass number on the periodic table because it will be wrong. Any questions on any of that stuff there? I think that's probably a good place to stop for today in terms of lecture. Uh, we obviously will on Tuesday continue on with this chapter. We'll probably roll into chapter two. We have lab today uh, starting again at 7.15 and uh, we're going to do the uh, experiment. Should be number one, I think. Uh, it's the flame test experiment. Again, if you don't have your lab manual yet, uh, the actual experiment should be up on Canvas for you to uh, sort of use and, and print out and that type of stuff. So we will talk about the experiment at the beginning of the lab. You'll go off and do the experiment and it will be due obviously tonight. Just not too bad of an experiment, I don't think. Any questions on anything before we wrap up lecture here? And get a chance to stand and stretch and all that good stuff. All right, so before you log off, uh, if you didn't